Hello, good evening everyone. Welcome to In Studio Live, the 65th edition. We are looking at how to shoot the moon and a very warm welcome to, to everyone. Uh, great to be with you again. Had a couple of technical gremlins to deal with right at the start. I uh, had an audition earlier this week for um, doing some cruise speaking when cruisers get back up uh, and running again. And I completely reconfigured um, OBS, which is the, the live streaming software. But I, uh, before I reconfigured everything, I copied it all over to a new profile and reconfigured on that, separate from the one I use on Sunday, only to find that because the names matched across the profiles, when I changed it on one profile, it changed it on the other. So a lot of my windows were no longer in the right places. A lot of my settings were wrong. So I've been going through trying to sort them all out. So my apologies if uh, a few things look a little bit awry as we, uh, uh, as we go through. I've also finally got my little uh, Stream Deck um, box for doing all the scene changes. So hopefully that will all work nice and smoothly as we go through the evening as well. Anyway, let's get going uh, on here. My usual plea right at the beginning, if you're new here, please uh, subscribe, please like, uh, those are two metrics that YouTube use to help promote the uh, the channel. Uh, so it really helps me if you can do that. And what also helps me is if you can share the uh, um, the live stream amongst your friends and anyone you think it might be helpful for. Uh, I know several of you have been doing that. Um, if, if you don't feel comfortable sharing a uh, uh, a video channel, then you can always invite people to the Facebook group because I'm pl promoting it there all the time uh, on that. Um, and talking to the Facebook group, if you aren't already a member, you're watching this for the first time, do join because that's where a lot of the conversations come, come from, a lot of the questions come from, and it's where uh, the challenge I'm going to be talking about as part of tonight's show, uh, where it, that links in with it as well. Um, and I have a newsletter, links for both of those down below uh, in the description box. So you can sign up for those. Uh, the show is interactive. Um, so if you see things going on, you want to comment on, um, if you uh, disagree with me, stick it in the live chat. I, I am monitoring it as much as I can. Uh, when I start doing uh, looking at Lightroom and Photoshop, I lose my um, uh, my details of the uh, of the live chat, but I do come back to it as we go through. So, what have we got on the show tonight? Well, we have got uh, our theme for tonight, which is how to photograph the moon, and that's our main topic for the night. Uh, we're going to look at the techniques on that, and. To be honest, it's much easier than you might think on there. Um, uh, on that, I have got the announcement of the new challenge. This is a biggie, this one. I hope plenty of you will take, a, take it up, uh, but it is one. It's not going to be an everyday thing, but it's, a, it's an every week thing uh, for, for a little while, actually. But at the end of it, I'm convinced you will be a better photographer for it, and you will have the proof uh, that you will that you are a better photographer for it. Um, and that is why it's called my before and after challenge. I'll explain more when we get to that. I've got a, a Photoshop tutorial on how to produce a composite uh, image. Uh, with the moon. It's one of those things where normally the moon on an image is tiny. It'd be nice to make it large. On the Facebook group, I gave you all the choice of two images uh, that I was going to work with. And uh, so far, not one person is interested in the Colosseum. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be the cranes. You'll see the two options in a moment. I've got image feedback and I will be finishing with the member photo of the week. Yeah, those were the two options, uh, pulling the moon behind the Colosseum and through the windows or behind the crane and behind the clouds. And the general consensus was people were interested in the cranes. So that's the one I'm going to go through later. Uh, let's hope I can remember how to do it. <laughs> 
Now I have practiced it. So let's get on with our main topic, shoot the moon. How do we shoot the moon? It's a very popular thing. The reason I've chosen to talk about it tonight is because tonight is a full moon. Well, it would be if the sky wasn't covered in clouds and it wasn't tipping it down with rain. Uh, but we can't have everything. Um, but these are the rules for uh, photographing it, the techniques and the settings that you will need to create those images on there. The problem is, if you just leave your camera on automatic, you'll get poor results because the, com the camera tends to get fooled by all the things around the moon, all the black and the dark that's there, and it overexposes it. So you need to be in manual mode, and we'll talk about those settings as we go through. It is a fairly simple technique. Once you understand it, you can easily photograph the moon almost without thinking about it to be honest with you uh, because things don't change it's always the same the light from the moon doesn't change because it's reflecting light back from the sun and the light from the sun generally doesn't change all right so you get an image like this reasonable results uh, this was uh, 400 millimeter zoom. Well, actually it was a 200 millimeter zoom with a two times converter on there. And you can see the detail. We've got the that brownie color uh, to it, uh, exactly as we'd expect. And this is the sort of thing I'm gonna teach you and show you how to do as we go through. So the standard settings for doing it, and this assumes a clear night. I'll explain in a little bit what we do if it's not a clear night, but these are for the times when it is a clear night. Set your aperture to f8. Simple as that. That uh, is usually where your lens is at its sharpest, so that's where you want to be in terms of your aperture. And then what about the other two variables? Well, it's dead easy. You set your ISO and your shutter speed to be the same. Simple as that. So in other words, if you are uh, shooting at uh, ISO 100, then set your shutter speed to be 100th of a second. If you are shooting at uh, 400th of a second, then set your ISO to 400 and just keep your aperture at f8. And that is all there is to it. Right, I, can I go home now? No, um, <laughs> it's a few extra things to talk about with it, but it really is just as simple as that um, on there. So f8 and ISO and shutter the same. However, uh, a couple of other things I should say is if you wanted to shoot at ISO 100, and you've got a 400 millimeter lens or longer on there so that it really fills the frame on your image, you're going to need a tripod. And if you're using a tripod, you need to switch off image stabilization. Why is that? Because image stabilization works off little gyroscopes, which is looking for movement. And then it counteracts that movement by adjusting a little lens. And so, if the movement's not there because you're on a rock solid tripod, those little gyroscopes are, are going, where's the movement, where's the movement? And they're, they're wobbling and they wobble that lens, which introduces blur to your image. So if you're on tripod, turn off your image stabilization. If you're hand holding, remember uh, the rule for choosing your shutter speed, which is basically, the, um, uh, the, your shutter speed should be the same as your focal length or the 35 millimeter equivalent on that. So if you're shooting with a, a 400 millimeter lens, to hand hold, you need to be shooting at 400th of a second. If you're shooting at 400th of a second, you need to have ISO 400. So basically you could say the, the simple rule is F8 and make your focal length, your shutter speed and your ISO all the same and you'll get a good image of the moon. 
Uh, the trouble is, if you are a hundred millimeter, it's only going to be tiny in the frame, and you're going to have to you're going to have to crop right in, and you're losing resolution, and therefore you're losing detail on that. So you really want that long lens. Uh, so if your camera, if you're shooting with uh, a point and shoot camera, a compact camera, you've got and you have the option to zoom right in, that will give you good results if you can get your camera into manual mode on there. Uh, if you can't get it into manual mode, you're going to have to use exposure compensation. You're really going to have to underexpose to stop it blowing out on there with a compact camera. Ideally, manual mode to get it to work uh, on there. So focal length, as I said, longer the better. I would say 400 millimeter is probably uh, really the minimum that you want. If you can get longer than that, great. Uh, you can get good results with it. You can get results with shorter lenses, but you'll have to crop. And then when you display the moon at comparable sizes on the screen, you'll see very much a difference in quality by doing it because you've cropped in on a smaller section. Therefore, there's fewer pixels for each bit of the detail. So what does that look like in practice? Well, this was shot on a 105 millimeter lens. You can see, or at least I hope you can see on the, uh, the video, it's a little bit blurry uh, on there when I cropped in. With my 400 millimeter, you can see how much sharper that is. And um, the, uh, the image there is, made up of more pixels so it's going to give that appearance of being uh, of being sharper now there's a question just come in on the uh, on the chat uh, from walter saying i presume you focus the lens at infinity yes it, you can either manually focus at infinity or um, if you've got a large enough view in your viewfinder you can actually focus on the edge of the moon because when you're focusing, the focusing mechanism requires contrast. So the edge of the moon is usually a good area of contrast uh, to focus on. So either of those uh, will work. Um, I'm going to talk about another technique that uh, at least one person um, watching this um, has sent me some information on. And I'm not entirely sure, I'm still not convinced by it, by the way, but we'll come on to that later. Um, right. So, yeah, the 400 millimeter, or rather 200 time, uh, 200 millimeter with a two, uh, two times converter gives a much, much better image uh, on there. Right. Sometimes, though, you've got haze and you've got clouds getting in the way of your image. And let's look at how we deal with that. So if the moon's behind the clouds, you're just going to have to expo uh, adjust your exposure for it. And there isn't a magic formula for it because it's just going to be trial and error. You're just going to have to try different settings to try and get what works for the uh, how deep the cloud is, how much haze there is, uh, and all that. Um, and basically, you, you just need to add light. Uh, and the way to do it is you'll either increase your ISO. You could, if, you've got, if you're on tripod, you could um, slow down your shutter speed, um, or you can open up your aperture um, a bit. So those are really your options uh, on there. If you're hand-holding, you, you need to keep that shutter speed uh, at that level, the same as what your uh, focal length is. So really that only gives you the, the other two to play with. But if you're on tripod, you've got all three settings. You want to add more light into your image by changing those. So let me give you an example of settings. Right, the moon here is pretty well hidden behind the clouds there. We can just see it peeking through. So for this, I uh, opened up my aperture by one stop, f5.6. I didn't want to go too far away from f, uh, f8 because I know that's where my le lens is at its sharpest. And I then, um, I, I, I'm basing this on a shutter speed of 125th of a second. So 
I then went, uh, I upped my ISO to 3200. So let's work this out. Assuming I'm at uh, 125th of a second, let's call it 100th of a second. Keep the maths nice and easy on here at f8. So going down to f6 gives me one stop of light. Going up from ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, five extra stops of light, which gives me a total of six extra stops of light um, to create this image. So the cloud is taking six stops of light out of this shot, uh, which I've had to compensate for. How did I know those values? Just trial and error uh, was the, the way I did it. And I just went through and thought, right, okay, it's too dark. I looked at my histogram and I then um, just thought, right, how many stops am I gonna need? I'm probably gonna need about four, I guessed. Uh, and took a shot with that, uh, changing a few, uh, changing my ISO, and realised it wasn't enough. Didn't want to go up up the ISO anymore, so instead I just opened the aperture one one stop. So we have a question in chat from uh, from Gary. If you're on a tripod, is there a limit to the exposure time? Good question, Gary. And I think you know the answer to this one. Um, it's I would. I would say try and limit it to no more than, I think I've heard a figure of about eight seconds uh, because of the, the, the movement of the, uh, of the earth on there. Uh, if you can keep it down to a couple of seconds, uh, you should be fine on that. Uh, don't try doing multi-minute multi ones because it's gonna start moving and you'll get a, a line uh, across there. Um, so I, I haven't got an exact figure on that one. Um, I'd have to look it up or, or experiment on it. But a couple of seconds, you'd be fine. The back of my mind, I think I've heard eight seconds as being the uh, uh, the figure to uh, to work with. But I can't remember where I've heard it or why I've heard that one. But I know it's definitely to do with the rotation of the Earth, which gives the appearance of the um, of the moon moving across the sky, so that sort of uh, thing, and you should be okay. So now this one it was a little bit more uh, peeking through the clouds. So same sort of idea. I knew I still had to add exposure to it. Uh, so I kept the f stop the same f eight. Uh, for this, I was I was shooting at a. Uh, 250th of a second. So I upped my ISO from, let's say, 200, uh, from ISO 200 um, to 800 to give me an extra two stops of light. And that's more or less right with the exposure on there. So that was an extra two stops. So you can see um, anything from six to two stops I needed uh, on this occasion um, uh, with those images. Now, the other thing just to say about those two images with clouds, uh, because I know a few of you are uh, cruisers um, on there, they were taken on board ship. And uh, of course, I couldn't use tripod because the ship's moving. So it was handheld. So how come at ISO, at uh, 400 millimeter, I was able to shoot at 125th of a second or um, one 250th of a second in this shot? Well, simply because my lens has got image stabilization and it can allegedly give me three stops of image stabilization. So therefore, in theory, I should be shooting at um, 400, at uh, ISO um, uh, 400th of a second. Uh, one stop is 200. Two stops is 100, uh, hundredth of a second, and it claims three stops of uh, image stabilization. I never believe the extra stop, so I, I should be okay at 125th of a second, and I, and I was. So that was the reason I was shooting at a shutter speed that's, um, that's slower than what I'm recommending, in case anybody was wondering. And we've got the yellow bar of YouTube not receiving enough video uh, on there. 
I can't keep bringing down my, my bit rate. I've brought it down loads and loads. I'm convinced it's not the bit rate uh, that's, uh, that's the cause of all this. But that's what we're getting at the moment. So hopefully you're okay. I'm just going to carry on regardless uh, and hope uh, you're, uh, you're able to hear me, if not, uh, if I'm, even if I'm a little bit frozen on the, uh, uh, on the screen. Oh, it's gone away again now. Right, let's talk about lunar eclipses. They happen every so often. I don't know when the next one is. I've not looked it up. I, I should have done that. But if you shoot a lunar eclipse, you need to play around a little bit with the settings. Now, if you look at this, uh, this image, we've got the top row was as we were going into eclipse. The bottom row was as we were coming out of it. The middle row was whilst the shadow of the Earth uh, was over the moon, giving it that red color uh, on there. Uh, now, with that, the top row and the bottom row, I could just use my standard settings. This was, um, again, it was on the ship. It, it, I, it was taken over a period of about four hours. I was out up on, uh, on deck photographing this, getting the full sequence. And it's almost a full sequence. You'll notice that very final image. There was a cloud just coming in right at the very end of it. Uh, but generally we got there um, with it. Uh, it's the best I've ever done on um, a lunar eclipse. But what about that middle row? Well, the middle row, as I said, is when the, uh, the Earth casts its shadow across the moon. And, uh, and it's in totality uh, on there. And we need some slightly different settings at that point. So for that, believe it or not, I had to find an extra nine stops of light. And if I didn't adjust, uh, you could see on the, uh, the top and bottom rows, if I just go back, you can see the shadow on the top and bottom ones. Uh, oh, this is interesting. I've got two mouse pointers on my screen here. Um, <laughs> why have I got two mouse pointers? Uh, oh, I know why. Yeah, I've, just, I've got, just got to look at the little one. You can only see one, folks. Um, pop, uh, full one, oh, 19th of the 11th this year. Oh, no, it's partial. Uh, full one um, on the 16th of May next year. So, right, you've got, you're getting the settings here for it. Uh, I'll have to redo the, revisit this video for those uh, when it comes on. But ba basically, the shadow is the bit that you can see in darkness, sorry, up here, uh, which is all of this section down here. So if I'd have left it at these settings, you would have just seen complete blackness. So for the middle section, what I did was I, op um, I opened it up by nine stops. So on my shots, what I had, uh, I'll lose my mouse pointer, yeah. Um, the way I did it was I went down to F2.8 uh, on, on there, simply because I had to, a uh, 50th of a second, and at ISO uh, 6400 uh, to be able to get this effect on there. And that gave me nine extra stops of light to be able to get the detail of the moon while it was in, in shadow, which is when it has that lovely red color to it, that blood moon uh, look uh, to it. Right, let's have a look at chat. Um, and the things in chat, that's come in are, uh, we've got uh, about the partial uh, lunar eclipse in November and a full lunar eclipse in May next year. So what's that, uh, 14 months away, something like that. Um, and we'll be looking at doing that, photographing it. So well, well found out folks on there. Right, uh, so. Let's have a look at uh, your images. I've been sent several by email. Um, 
this week. So if you've got images you want me to look at, I give priority to ones which have been sent to feedback at ians-studio.co.uk during the week. I'll look through those, uh, give some feedback, um, and then I'll pick some from the Facebook group, which I'll do later in the show. So let me head over to Lightroom and uh, I'll set this up and I'll switch over to it in a moment. Uh, no. Right, so by email. Right, uh, this is where I haven't quite yet got my, um, uh, my deck set up to be able to go straight through to uh, to Lightroom, but we're getting there. Right, now, here's the thing. Bob Toby um, posted an image of the moon, uh, which he had, um, had done a focus stack uh, on. And I still maintain that you shouldn't need to focus stack the moon. Uh, I'm going to go full screen on here so we can see. Um, so here, at full screen, it is Bob's focus stacked image. And if I zoom right into 100%, we can see we've got areas of edge to it. It's all looking, it is looking sharp um, on there. There's a little bit of a color, uh, color noise on it, uh, but it's a lovely, it's a good image um, and good quality uh, and good size on it. But let's just have a look at some of the images that made up the stack. Now, in this one, I would say, hmm, I'm not, I would say that the, obviously it's sharp down at the bottom, but I find it hard to believe that this is any more at infinity than round here. So let's just step through some of the others. And have we got, that's still sharp at the bottom. Let's step through. Start sharp at the bottom. I'm not, I'm still seeing a lot of color noise in there. Um, I'm not seeing much that's noticeably uh, different focus uh, on there uh, with it. Uh, so zooming out on there. Um, what I should have done was to try putting them into um, Photoshop and do a difference on there to show the difference. I, I think the difference is negligible between the stacked version and the others. Um, I know Bob got the technique off somebody else, um, but to my mind, I can't see a huge difference between uh, the different images in the sequence in terms of where it's focused. Now, it might be different amounts of haze that would cause, cause it to have be slightly different on different ones, but, and therefore, now, did I notice a difference between that and that? Yes, I have noticed a difference between those two shots. Now, what is this one? Let's have a look. That's the stacked image. So where is the one that it's got the sharp bits from over there? This is curious. I can see where you're coming from, Bob, but I'm still not convinced with it. Uh, I, I think what I would want to do is do an experiment myself on that at some point to um, uh, to work out exactly how that um, that works, uh, to make to see how that um, that works. I'm I'm not 100% convinced. I can see a little bit of a difference um, with it. Right, uh, keeping with the moon shots at the moment, John Barton. Let's have a look at this one. Um, again, sent by email. It's slightly soft. Um, let's have a look at the settings uh, on this. Collapse that. And so we're 100, uh, oh, sorry, 300 and 
twenty um at one three hundred and twentieth of a second it was shot at focal length of two four two four seven so certainly um fast fast enough for that the fact that we've got the blue sky in there i suspect there's still a fair bit of um atmospheric haze in that that was is probably causing the softness on it let's see what we can do in post-production about that because i think the dehaze might help a little bit so a little bit of dehaze a little bit of clarity will bring that we've got a fair bit of noise in there so detail and just bring up the noise reduction um, on there a little bit of contrast to it and then sharpening i'm holding the alt key so i can see what it's doing and detail and then let's just mask it so that we just sharpen the edges so before and after that's before and that's after so we've managed to bring a little bit of the detail out uh, on uh, on that one uh, on there so nice shot john let's have a look uh paul um two different images here again um that's the 100 percent and for the size of it it's it's nicely sharp once i zoom in of course i'm beyond 100 percent, so it's going to look soft uh, on there but that's not bad uh, it's slightly underexposed i would say so let's just see what we can do on that i would just like to see a little bit more exposure maybe bring the clarity up just slightly it's had some clarity work done on it before so i would go with something like that uh, with there uh, the color on it i think looks a bit artificial unless it was taken during uh, uh, a lunar eclipse because it's a little bit too too brown on there so i would try and bring that back to a bit more of a, a moon color maybe take the vibe the saturation down just a little bit and i think that's probably a little bit more realistic uh, for it on there um what else the other one from paul let's have a look at this one in 100 percent the same sort of thing so um i'm going to develop module and previous settings has it remember them yeah something like that with it um again i would probably crop it as well uh, with that uh, do something like that Let's take the probably coming a little bit too far on the crop up a little bit down a little bit out a little bit that'll do me so yeah I, again we're at that's a hundred percent on there again slightly soft let's have a look at the settings on this oh, i haven't got the settings unfortunately uh, nor on that one either um with it so whether i did with this yeah um yeah right a uh, couple of other images that were sent um these are from john's uh, drone i uh, don't want to go through all of these uh, john because i'm, I'm not a, a drone um expert the only thing i would say as i've said several times before um do your editing before you submit the images then i can i can give you some more sensible feedback um on the usual um sort of thing with something like that your subject being central is not quite working and is that horizon straight yeah it's slightly tilted so let's sort that out and what it 
it's a matter of where we decide the, the crop should be. Again, avoid having that horizon in the middle, uh, which I've said so many times. Um, and maybe just something like that with it. But it, we've got a lack of detail down here um, with it. So can we bring any of that back? By the time we do, we're going to get very noisy on there. So it's a nice sunset, but overall, I don't think it's one of your best images, uh, John. Uh, personally, I don't like the horizon following the line of the of the wheel on the on the pier either. Uh, with that, uh, what else am I going to pick up on? Again, same sort of thing here. Um, I think we've got a sloping horizon. Yeah, we have. So things like that, no real foreground interest on there. Needs a bit more exposure to it. I don't know what control you have over exposure uh, with the drone, but uh, if you can get into, you, if there's any form of uh, exposure compensation uh, with it um, to do that, um, I'm never really convinced with, uh, I mean, I, I have the DJI Pocket and I wouldn't use it for stills. It's a video camera. Um, it doesn't do the, I don't use it for stills in emergencies um, on there. Um, so it's, they're not really designed for that. They, they give you a much better video result than still result. Uh, on that. So any, anyway, I'm going to leave it at that for the emailed uh, images uh, that we, uh, we've had this, uh, this week. And if I head to the, see what's been going on in chat. Um, right. Uh, Gary, uh, so, oh, uh, Gary saying, won't there be a different focus distance between each shot due to the orbit of the moon and the earth? I'm not sure on that. I think infinity is infinity um, at that point. It's a matter of uh, whether, if your lens is at infinity, the, the, the depth of field that you've got, uh, something like F8, is going to be, is going to cover um, that sort of, um, it might be a different focus point, but the distance in, um, if you're taking those shots within a few minutes of each, uh, a few seconds of each other, then it, it, I don't think it's going to be that, that significant. And Andy, uh, nice that you can join us. Um, yes, you can make some amazing differences in Lightroom. Big fan of, um, of, uh, working in post-production on images, uh, not at the detriment of getting it right in camera. Get it as far right in camera as you can and then do the next stage in post-production. Hmm. Excuse me. Right. So, let's uh, have a look at next. Right, okay. Which image for the post-production demo? Well, According to Facebook, so far, it's all been the crane on that. Uh, so let me set up for that and I'll give you the uh, tutorial on how to put the moon behind an object. So go, uh, right. Minimize that. Actually, I didn't mean to minimize that. Uh, that and Photoshop. That's the one I want. Right. So now, uh, right. So what I've got here are the two images. I've got my shot of the moon, and I've got the shot of the the cranes. So we want to get one. Uh, we want the moon to be behind the clouds 
and um, behind the crane. And that's going to be an absolute swine to manually cut round on there. So what, am I go what, what I'm going to do with this, first of all, unlock that bottom layer. Next, I'm going to go over to this image and actually I'm going to go full screen on this because I think you need to see what's going on. So if I grab that and drag it over here and drop it on there. Now you can see the comparative sizes. That's how much I had to crop in on that image, even at 400 millimeter. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to move the, turn the opacity down so I can see where it is and I'm going to position the, uh, the moon. And Control T allows me to get the bounding box and I'm just going to move this to approximately where I want it. I want it overlapping the building slightly. I want it overlapping the crane and I definitely want the hook into, in, into it. So I think that's going to be approximately the position I want uh, for it. So I will OK that. And now I can change the opacity all the way back up. So what we don't want around this is all the black. We want to cut the moon out. So let me just uh, zoom in slightly on the moon. So we've got that. The way I'm going to do it is I'm going to create, put a couple of some guides in there. Now, if you don't see the guide, the, the margins on yours, uh, view and show rulers here. And once you've got the rulers, I always have them there because it means to put a guide in, I can just drag from the ruler and I drag to just inside the edge of the moon. Same at the top, just inside on the far side, just inside and same at the bottom just inside, whoa, that's too far. Um, to, re to adjust it, if, it, if you've got it in the wrong place, um, you can, if you come off the image, you can get the um, thing there to adjust. If you want to do it inside here, oh, it does allow me. Um, it's often you hold the control key down, which will allow you to do it as well. And then you just move it over. So we've got that. Now I'm going to use a circular mask, which is generally hidden under the rectangular one. Click and hold, elliptical marquee tool. And I can use these guides to get this right. So I start on that point uh, top left, and I just drag this all the way down to there. And we end up with a circle just within the moon. Now, one setting that you need on this, and I, I always draw the thing first and uh, then think, doll, I need to set the feather. You need a feather on here of about seven, five or seven pixels on there. I'm just going to uh, undo that. Um, and I'm going to change this one to five pixels. And if you just draw that back, you And we're in there. And what the feather does is it gives a softer edge to the uh, to the image, so it's not this harsh cutout on there. It gives a much more pleasing uh, look. So having created created that, I'm going to do Control C to copy it. And actually, Control X it cuts it out, and then Control V to paste it in as a layer on its own right. Uh, actually, undo that. If I do, um, if I hold Control Shift C, no, it's Shift Edit Shift and Paste. No, it's not pulling it back in the right place. Never mind. I I thought there was a, a modifier just to put it exactly where it came from. So I'm just moving it approximately where I need, and then I can get rid of the outline on it. So it's in the place I want it. But the moon's in the wrong side, is in front of uh, the other objects. I want it, I want them, want it to be behind. So how do we do it? Right. What we're going to do is we're going to use um, channel masking uh, to create the effect on this. So I'm going to go over down here on the right hand side to channels, and I'm looking at the four. Uh, 
I need to hide that first of all. Click on the little eye to get rid of it. Otherwise, we'll mask the moon as well. Go back to channels. I'm looking for the one that for the sky being as light as possible. So it's the red is the one I want on there. If I can go through them, because we're going to use this as a mask. And basically, the way it works is um, black will be the bits that show through. Uh, sorry, white will be the bits that show through the moon and the black will be the bits of the original image. So uh, the red one is more or less what I want on there. So I'm going to duplicate the channel. I'll call it red copy. Having got that, uh, I can now control A to select all of it uh, and control C to copy it. Go back to layers and then click on the topmost layer, control V, and it pastes that in as a layer of its own. So now it's in there, I can start modifying that. And the way I'm going to modify it is I'm going to use uh, a curves adjustment over there. Uh, so with that curves adjustment, let me pull the properties out so we can see what we're doing on here. Uh, the curves adjustment, if you don't know how curves work, I've done a tutorial on it a couple of weeks ago um, in one of the live streams. What I want to do is to make the dark sections, the black sections, which are going to... Uh, that's just that little bit darker. I didn't mean that. Get rid of that. And the white sections, a little bit whiter. So just bring that in. And where it's white, it will show uh, the... Uh, the moon will show through on there. So if we just bring that in a little bit more and we can start now to see that all the crane and the buildings are black. So that's probably going to be sufficient for this, but I could, if I wanted, just make it that little bit more contrasty in the middle to something along those lines. Yep, I, I will go with that. So let's just pop that back onto there. Now, I'm going to, the reason I do it as a, an adjustment layer rather than directly on it is because it allows me, if I now think, oh, I want to change it, I can do. So what I'm going to do now is hide that. I've got both of those selected and I'm just going to do edit, Uh, copy on there. That should work. I'm doing this slightly differently to how I did it when I was practicing. Uh, right. I now need to hide both of those. I need to put a mask on the moon. Put that back in there. Enable the moon. Put a mask in there. And now I have to alt click on that which shows the entire mask, and I can now paste into that. So control V, except it hasn't taken my, it didn't copy it as I hoped it would. So I've got to bring these back. I'll do it the, I'll do it the other way. Sorry about that one, folks. I've got those layer and just merge those two layers together. Now, control A, control C on there. Hide that, bring that back, bring that back. No, wrong one, that one back. Onto there. Alt click on it to show that, and I should now be able to just paste into it, which I can do on there. So now, uh, if I click away from it, we can see the moon is now behind uh, the object, so it's used that as a mask. Now, that now I've done that, let me just um, zoom in a little bit so we can see how effective masking like this is. And it's incredibly clean in terms of the mask uh, on there. It's absolutely perfect. You've got all the different bits uh, showing through on there. But one of the, the wonderful things about this technique, if I just come out a little bit 
onto here. If I wanted to reposition the moon, if I break the link here, if I click on that to remove it, the mask stays where it is. I can just move the moon around behind the, uh, the clouds and everything else. Uh, so I can now get that in the exact position I want it uh, for my composition uh, to make it work, which would be something like that. Control D because it's selected. And now there is one thing that I would tweak with this, and that is it looks as though it's in front of this cloud at the top. Um, it's because it's a very faint cloud. It just looks wrong. So what I can do um, with it is I can adjust my mask. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use a paintbrush. I'm going to set my opacity. I'm going to set it up to about 67%. But I'm going to keep a fairly low flow, which means I can build this up. Um, and I've got a soft brush. And on there, I can now just paint in just a little bit to actually move it behind that um, the cloud, let the cloud cover come through just a little bit more on there. And that's probably just enough. That's all I'll need just to help sell the fact that it really is behind that little bit of cloud. So, yeah. So there is our, uh, our finished image uh, of it. The one final thing I would do is I would get rid of those, um, uh, this is where I press the con control key and just I can drag them up onto the the rulers to get rid of them. So that's where I've cleared those and final image. Uh, so hopefully you found that um, that instruction and that technique useful. Went through it fairly quickly. Uh, if you need to see that uh, again, just rewatch. Right, I've got. I'm running out of time, folks, and I've not announced the uh, the forthcoming challenge. So let's get back to the PowerPoints, and I can uh, uh, I can do that. Well, let's move on, folks. Um, just to say at this point, tonight's live stream is sponsored by yourselves. Uh, I have this thing called Buy Me A Cuppa. The link's there on my screen. It's also down below. If you found the, the live stream helpful and you want to say thank you in a financial way, there's a link down below to buymeatea.com forward slash Ian Butty where you can buy me a cup of tea. And as a way of me saying thank you to people who bought me a cuppa, each week I put a name on the mug and tonight's name is David Wayne. Thanks, David. Hmm. Moving on. Uh, let's have a quick look at what's been going on in chat um, with this. So in chat, we have got um, some a brilliant and an amazing uh, and a nice technique from uh, Andy Grady. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. Um, the technique I've used to be able to do that that sort of cutting out. It's also used for things like cutting out complex shapes uh, and particularly good for cutting out hair. Now, what's really interesting, you all chose the, um, uh, the crane image. Believe it or not, that's actually the easier image to do than the Colosseum. The Colosseum one was the harder one to do. Uh, believe it or not, because you, there's an extra step you have to do on the, uh, the Colosseum one because uh, the things that are going in front aren't all dark. Some of them are light, so there's an extra step on it. Uh, but the, the crane is a, uh, the much more interesting image. So anyway, uh, maybe I'll do the Colosseum one some other time. Right, let's um, carry on. <clears throat> um, the, the challenge that's starting, it's actually going to start in a week's time. I'm announcing it now, giving you the heads up, and letting you have, you can start now if you want. It means you have two weeks to do the first week's uh, work. It's called my before and after challenge. It's a brand new one that I'm creating. And the idea is 
that if you go through the challenge, do the different stages of it, you'll learn a whole load of photography techniques, or you, it will encourage you to consolidate your skills with a whole load of techniques on there. And the stage one for before and after is you need to get your before images. And what I want you to do is to pick a location, somewhere that you can um, get back to at the end of the challenge. So it, it needs to be somewhere where there's a number of photographic opportunities. So it might be a local park, it might be a particular town, it might be a village somewhere. Uh, you, if you're into people photography, uh, find a person to join you there and do this as a uh, location portrait um, um, exercise. But make sure it's a person that will be able to join you again in about three months' time because you'll need to go back to that location after about three months. Uh, you'll, you'll understand why as we go through. And that's why it's the before and after, because you are going to do the same exercise twice, once at the beginning, once at the end, and in between, there's going to be 12 weeks of specific photographs to take, which will teach you various techniques or consolidate techniques with your photography. Um, so by the end, when you go back and reshoot, you should end up, if this all works, yeah, you will end up with better photographs on the reshoot than you do before. So it's really important you do the before images because this is your benchmark to see how you've changed uh, on the, uh, as the challenge goes on. So what I want you to do, when, you get, when you've picked your location, you go there, you, I want you to create five different images that give a sense of place for your location. Or if you're including the person, a sense uh, of that person in that location. Uh, so uh, it might be, um, well, these images should show a different aspect. Um, and there should be different styles and different techniques on there. Shoot more than five and then pick your best five that sum up that location. So the sort of things you're, you're trying to get, it, it needs to be a mix of, well, sort of general location, showing the, the, the whole place. It might be a, a few details from it that help summarize that location. It might be some specific features. So. Um, if you've chosen a town that you wanted to photograph, there might be an iconic view across the town. There might be a well-known landmark in the town that you would photograph. But yet there might be a small detail of a sign with the town's name on. Um, it, it's, uh, and then there might be a couple of other images uh, in there uh, to tell the story about that town. And just imagine that we are creating these for a brochure. If it's a park, it's if you were doing a, a, a brochure to publicize this part and you've been told they can only have five images, what are the five images that you're going to create to tell the story of that location? Now, if you are including people and doing it as a, a portraiture uh, thing, because I know some of you are big on your portraiture, then try and find the different aspects of that person's uh, personality. If they're... Um, an active person, maybe have them doing something there. If they're more of a creative person, maybe your, your photograph will have them photographing the location as part of it uh, and, and have them as part of that scene. Once you've got your images from that shoot, pick the five images that best sum up that location. And I want you to then upload those images to the Facebook group, create one post with all five images in. That's your benchmark before images. I'll give you some feedback on them uh, as usual um, on that, but those will stay there as the benchmark because you're gonna go back at the end of the thing and you're going to do the same exercise in the same location. And I think you will approach it differently after going through what happens on the 12 weeks before. Uh, but 
as I say on the thing, only post five images uh, from it. Don't do the whole set, just the five, because that's part of the skill, is just learning how to edit down and learning to choose the images that make that location. So the challenge then, after that, that's before we've got 12 weeks of challenges that follow. And they're not as difficult as the before as doing that before shoot. You'll be given something to do for that week. And over those 12 weeks, the different exercises will be designed to help you improve the way that you make images, help you understand some very specific photographic techniques because you'll be asked to do something. There'll be things that you've done before, but not necessarily done in the particular way that I'm asking you to do them. And it's that doing them in this particular way which will help you really understand what's going on. Uh, and then at the end of it all, you'll go back to the location that you did your before images and you'll reshoot. And then we can compare the two, the before and after, and we will see that improvement on your work. So what are those little themes that you're going to be asked to do in the intervening weeks? Well, I'm going to do one on three specific rules of composition. I'm going to get you to understand blur and freezing, uh, depth of field, uh, focal length, how that affects your images, um, and getting the right time for evening shots, uh, how to reflect light into the into a scene using a reflector of some description. Um, I'm going to go through exposure compensation and get you to understand that. Fill in flash, uh, the golden hour and how that compares to shooting midday. We're gonna look at the difference between color and monochrome. Uh, we're gonna look at something I call above, below, between uh, on there, how that affects. And shady places, how we deal with that. Um, when to use a shade, shady location versus direct sunlight. So those are the things. So at the moment, all you need to know is that within two weeks, well, I'm going to announce it. I'll probably announce it during the week, actually. But you'll have until a week on Sunday to get your five images together of a location. Now, you don't have to travel halfway across the country to find the location, but do remember tomorrow, we're not having to stay at home for those of us here in, uh, in England um, on there. So let's have a look uh, at the chat and I will post more about this over the coming week. And to help you with it, my theme for next Sunday's live stream is going to look at this idea of sense of place in our photography and how we create a group of images to tell the story of a location. That's going to be our theme next week. So in the chat, nothing new other than the fact that Andy Wright has joined us. Hello, Andy. Welcome um, on there. So feedback on the Facebook images. I haven't got much time. I'm already out of time. But let me very, very briefly go over and just talk about a couple of these. Um, there's not much I want to say on them, unfortunately. Um, so uh, let's come over. Right. Uh, nice flower shot from Gary, Pra uh, Gary Platt uh, on there. Uh, of the ones that you posted, Gary, I like this one because it fills the frame and there's an actual sort of S shape in here as well with it, which also helps that composition work. So nice shot on there. Um, this one from, uh, from Fiery Dawn, let me go into the develop module on this. It's a little bit overexposed. So just bringing the exposure down a fraction, bringing the contrast up, giving it a bit more texture and it's a bit hazy. So let's cut through the haze. Uh, we've got that. Now I can bring that exposure back and we've got the detail in there. Just need to protect those highlights a little bit. Just bring those down and before and after. That's before, that's after. So it just needed a little bit of um, uh, being, it's just that slightly overexposed really. If you just underexpose it. Another tip for you with this one, finally, uh, is 
to shoot from below. We often shoot shower flowers looking down. Try getting the camera below and looking up at them. It gives a really good effect uh, on there. John, um, other than say, love this one. Really nice one. Well done, mate. Uh, Richard, I'm still having trouble seeing this as a field. It looks like material with a with a, a, a seam down it. I know it's tire tracks, I know it's a field, and I know you created it with your drone, but it definitely looks like something else. Uh, and I think it's a cracking abstract shot. Um, it's one of my favorites for the week. Um, and it almost, I almost made it the image of the week Unfortunately, you were picked at the post by another one. Oh, another one from uh, Finally Dawn. Uh, Moonshot. Okay, it's night. Uh, um, taking it at this time of day, again, it will always be that little bit hazy uh, at that time of day, photographing the moon. Uh, but possibly the only time with... I don't know what camera you're using on here. And Facebook doesn't tell me, but I think it might be a phone camera. And they probably will struggle with the nighttime versions um, of that. Right, Andy, I love this shot. Um, uh, the, the sort of smoky effect on the water, the long exposure on that. I don't know what settings you've got uh, with it uh, because it's a Facebook shot and it strips all the EXIF data out. I like the way it leads us into it. Um, the fact that I would, I would think you've probably gone for about a one second exposure with there would be my guess uh, on it. Nicely positioned waterfall on the rule of thirds uh, with it. We've got lead in lines of the, of the river. Uh, and it, it's just interesting. Uh, it's, it's got a, light, a nice softness to it. And I don't mean in an unsharp way because it really is sharp. It's tack sharp on there. Uh, but there's, it's there's a gentleness to the the colour. It's not um, contrasty with it. If I've got one nitpick, it's this this red in the background up there. Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't like it, and it's drawing my eye. <laughs> Sorry, uh, on there. I would recommend in Photoshop or in Lightroom. We just deal with that. How easy is it to deal with it? It's dead easy with an adjustment brush. Uh, and I'm going to reset everything by double clicking on the word effect um, on there. And I am going to take um, the saturation right down. I am going to say auto mask uh, with that. And I'm just going to go onto the red there and I'm just going to paint over it until eventually we lose that redness on it. Now, if I had the full resolution, I could go in closer to do that. I'm just going to try, I'm going to go in 400 just to make it easier for me to actually hit the the bits that need to have the colour removed. And we're, we're getting there with it. In fact, I'm going to pull put the flow right up. I'm running out of time, basically. So let's get rid of most of that. Come on. And the rest of it. Is it going? Okay. Right up on the flow. And I'm going to take auto mask off and just make this much smaller and do it that way. And what I've done is I've just taken the color out of it so that now, if I go back to 100%, oh, and I come out of the adjustment brush, which is K, that pin's gone. And it's, it doesn't draw the eye now as it was before. Uh, so hopefully that sort of little technique uh, helps uh, with that one, uh, Andy. And yeah, that, that's the full set on there. So back over to here. Let's have one last look before I finish. Right. 
Um, yeah, Andy saying that he used the Lee's little stopper on uh, on there. Uh, with that, right, we've got last couple of slides, and we are done on uh, uh, on this. So. Um, in the chat, I've had a look at that, nothing more really to add on it. And now time to announce the member photo of the week, which is the image that goes on the banner on the Facebook group. And this week's member photo of the week is, it had to be, I'm afraid, Andy. Uh, Andy, you just pipped Richard at the post on that. I ummed and ahed for a long, long time which one I was going to use uh, on it. And I thought Andy's was the one I wanted this week uh, on the uh, um, on the banner. So that's what it's going to look like on the banner. I didn't do that little tweak I did. What I have done, though, is I flipped it to uh, avoid the waterfall hiding behind my, uh, my logo. So hopefully you don't object too much to me flipping that, uh, Andy. But congratulations on... Uh, having the photo of the week. Uh, I will change the, uh, uh, the image as soon as the live stream is over. And to everyone else, make sure you submit some images this week because it, uh, and it may be your image next week as the photo of the week. So final look at the live chat. Nothing, um, nothing new on there uh, on that. So next Sunday, sense of place is what I'm going to look at about how in a small number of images we capture the flavor of a location. So this will is tying in with the before and after challenge and will help you when you do that. Um, if you want to do the challenge before then, then, then go ahead. But this is next Sunday is designed to be the one which will really help you with it um, um, as the challenge goes on. So that's next week. And thank you everyone for watching. Uh, thank you for the, the cups of tea and uh, for uh, the usual thing of share, like, um, subscribe, do all that as ever. And until um, next time, um, thanks for watching and keep making uh, great photos. <laughs> Bye for now. Right, this is the point I do the alternative ending for when, when and if I produce a cut down version of this. This will be the alternative ending. You've just been watching a cut down version of uh, In Studio Live. Uh, thanks for watching. If you want to see the full one, it's over in my academy. Uh, the details of that are over my shoulder. It's just £6 a month or £60 a year to become an academy member. Lots of other useful resources in there. Uh, do uh, keep it in mind. And thanks for watching. Until next time, keep making great photos. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.